Hi folks, this is the story of the most complicated, most difficult part we've ever made. Uh, and this part is a generatively designed longboard skateboard truck. We partnered with Gavin Bath from CAD Pro Systems. Gavin had already built a really cool motorized version. It started as a Daytron longboard from IMTS 2018. We ran into each other at Autodesk University. Um, he was trying to push the limits and start playing with generative design. And that's when I said, hey, we'd love to take a stab at helping you out on this project. And I'm so glad we did. It's been a pleasure working with Gavin, the work that he has put into this and now sharing with everybody and the process that he went through to create the generative design and the tool pass is awesome. We're really proud to be done with it, but what it represents, cutting edge aspects of what's happening in manufacturing and machining and technology. So with that, what is generative design? It's using the computer to design parts for you. So really, no one built this part. The computer built it. So if you kind of rewind through the history of how we as humans have made parts, um, take a shelf bracket. It's a really simple part for so long, it was an easy process to make with the tools that we have. Well, in the last few decades, the tools that we have have really changed. Things like common access to five axis machining, additive manufacturing, metal 3D printing, five axis water jets, the list goes on. But also the software side of things, because many times when we design something, it may be over-designed, but there are so many things in this world where weight and size really matter. And I think there's some really cool aspects to where we can now take some of these new manufacturing tools and combine them with the new technology tools to let computers design stuff for us. The essence of what generative design did here is we told Autodesk Fusion 360, we need to have something mounted here and here and here, so you can't change that. But otherwise, in between there, this needs to be strong enough for a person on a longboard. So you think about the load cases or the stresses involved in the weight of a person and the fact this is going on a longboard, we just did a regular material with a relatively normal process. But generative design can literally give you permutations based on cost drivers, access to raw material. You can push it to the direction of sheet metal or two-dimensional cutouts from things like a laser. We'll do a card up here to some of the other generative design projects that we've seen. I know there's one involved with a, an airplane component uh, that's actually flying as well as Volkswagen is using it for some wheels and parts on the new microbus. It's this kind of merger between biology and, and evolution and machine parts because so many of the generatively designed parts end up looking like these very organic structures, which really just ties back into this idea that, that nature has figured it out and that there are some really, really awesome furniture designs and other product designs that have this lattice-like structure, which ends up being incredibly strong, even though it doesn't always look strong. If there's one thing that's true about generative design, it's only going to get easier and more accessible for everyday folks that are using software to either make better decisions about the process, the material, the factors of safety behind it, or at least just be in the know with what the capabilities are of the part that's being made. Like so many CNC machine parts, we started with some drilling, some roughing, some semi-roughing, and then some finishing. And it's the finishing that really pushed us on this part. Gavin is kind enough to let us share the file, so I want to encourage everyone who wants to go learn and push themselves go download this file, go poke through it. Two real surfacing toolpaths that we spent a lot of time on here were Scallop, which oddly enough is just a three axis toolpath, but then also steep and shallow. The video that Lawrence Weinschenk, what he did at Autodesk University is a publicly available video, which we'll have on the page where he goes through some of the breakdown behind how steep and shallow works and why it's so awesome. Where it really helped us here was it's a tool path that can handle really steep walls, which previously was something that you would often use 3D contour for, as well as relatively shallow or flatter surfaces, which previously you would use something like parallel or scallop for. Steep and shallow can merge both of those tool paths into one tool path, which is gonna give us better servicing and blending control with the absolute amazing added bonus of five axis capability. Again, go watch Lauren's video. He talks about the ability to force a lead or a lean on the toolpath. What we used was the automatic collision avoidance. So there are some really tight nooks and crannies here. We wanna minimize our tool stick out and we wanna minimize our gauge length, but you still just have areas that are very difficult to reach. And the steep and shallow toolpath automatically calculates how it needs to make use of a five axis machine tool to tip the part over so that we aren't rubbing or cutting on the shank of the tool or the holder and still get 
in and machine those details. Just so cool. How do we trust the part in the process to make sure that we end up with a great part and not have any collisions or crashes in the machine? And there really were two key takeaways for this. The first is that we did three different operations on this part. We did a roughing to prepare the stock, we did an op one, and then we did an op two. Even though all three of those happened with different setups and work holding devices, the coordinate system remained the master gauge location of our fifth axis rock lock zero point system. And this is huge because I'm never reprobing the part. And one of the keys to this is making sure what you've got at the machine matches what you've got modeled in Fusion. And so for us, we've got the solid models of our, the rock lock base, the vise, and then our stock and we were just using calipers to make sure when we put that stock into the vise and we locate it, it matches up. That gives me the confidence to know we've got the stock located correctly and when we run simulation, the results that we're gonna get will match what happens on the machine. And it was the simulation and complete true path here that really brought this home for us because this was a really long cycle time and using complete gave me the confidence to know that we could walk away from the machine and let it run whether we're here in the shop or whether we've left and we'd end up with a part that was free of gouges and most importantly, free of any machine collisions. So much of this part was done at what's called B90 when it's sipped over. And B90 often puts the spindle housing really close to your trunnion platter. So we have OP1 done. We need to figure out a way though to both hold it for OP2 and give ourselves a good reference datum. And this is one of the coolest machining tricks I've seen out there. A uh, huge shout out to Rob Lockwood. He may not have invented this, but he certainly has refined it and we appreciate him sharing it with us. Card to his YouTube channel here. We machined this block of aluminum on the Tormach 1100MX. And the profile here will interface with our part. We have not machined this, this area right here. We're gonna take the 3 8 screw the elegance of this technique is that there isn't any accuracy required in this block because we're going to machine that in while we still have our good OP1 work coordinate system. Adding a second screw because two is much better than one when it comes to work holding. And I've got some rubber in there to avoid any marring on the part. And then we're gonna use some hot glue. Now this isn't necessarily mandatory and it's certainly true that we're getting the majority of our work holding through the two fasteners, but what the hot glue can do is help minimize any amount of chatter or minor vibrations. And if for some reason you need to remove a screw and make a quick adjustment, there's a much better chance that you're gonna be able to hold the location after you've machined it in place because of the hot glue. There are also situations when you're doing lighter duty work, certainly with plastics or other non-metallic materials where the hot glue itself may be sufficient with either one or even no fasteners. We have our OP2 fixture modeled. And again, our current stock for that part is larger than the CAD model. So what we're going to do now, we're gonna machine the outside profile of this part. And that gives us a single edge, which will be our X axis. And that will rest in our fifth axis self-centering vise. And then we're also gonna come over and we've got access to an area of that part where we're going to machine a bore and that bore becomes our X, Y, Z, W, C, S. So Fusion and the machine know exactly where my part is. We then have a simple tool path that comes around, faces this off, that establishes that the Z face of this part is perpendicular to my vise and does a 2D contour around it. So I've now established what is effectively an X and a Y plane. We can then pull this out and in this case, the block that we added not only serves as our locating device, it's also serving as our work holding device. We learned some really important lessons that are worth sharing. The first way we did this was what you just saw using the piece of aluminum that we bolted onto the part and later held in the self-centering vise. If you did it this way, you would wanna triple check the alignment of your vise, especially as a self-centering vise closes in on itself. The better way was to take advantage of the rock lock system. Machine the rock lock studs directly into that extra piece of material. Then that fixture is gonna clamp directly down to the rock locks. And those rock lock studs are going to locate more repeatably than a self-centering vise will. But the third way is absolutely amazing. And it really brings home the technology theme in this project, which is the new part inspection feature within Fusion 360. Whether you've got a complicated shape, a casting, uh, a part that just came back from anodized and you need to compensate it 
ever so perfectly so that your engraving just looks so crisp. You drop your part in there, you pick a bunch of probe points, Fusion will pull up your inner shell probe, it will probe all those points, and then it will dump back to you a master override that will update your whole coordinate system seamlessly to shift your code so that regardless of how square or out of square or out of alignment your part is, this was the first time I'd ever used it and it worked absolutely uh, amazing. We are continuing to learn more about the tooling and the holders that we like using on our five axis machine. We've continued to use a lot of the five inch and six inch Mari Tool ER collet holders because they're relatively inexpensive and they make it relatively easy to switch out to different style mills, taps, drills, engravers, etc. We also tried some extensions and some hydraulic holders here that worked out great. Um, but the best tooling that this project pushed us to explore were smaller diameter relieved shank tools. Most of these were from helical, so square bull nose and ball nose, 3 16 and 1 8 inch you know, solid carbide tooling where we just needed that abnormally long reach, but the relieved shank so that we could get in there with those steep and shallow and scallop tool paths to do all this surfacing. Don't look too closely, there are a couple of mistakes, but it's part of the process. We learned so much, and again, thank you uh, to the shout out to Gavin. It felt really good to, to make that finished part, drop it in to DHL and have it arrived in New Zealand where he's assembled it. And again, we'll have a link in the description to his video where he walks through uh, how he went through the generative process. And you can actually see him using uh, his electric longboard, which is really super cool. Uh, but as always, folks, hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed. Take care. See you soon.